The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's webinar on tax and the sharing economy. Now, some people not, will know what the sharing economy is, and that's probably why they're watching it uh, today. And by the end of it, though, everyone should have a better idea of um, what that actually means. Moving on, that's me, Derek Nolan. I'm the owner of 12 Chartered Accountants. I've been doing these webinars for about three or four years now. So if you haven't, um, if you're just tuning in for the first time, check out all the other ones I've done on uh, www.12.com.au and go to webinars. You'll see um, a really good uh, variety of business ones and for, um, for non-business owners as well. Today, we're actually talking a little bit uh, different uh, it's, it's about personal uh, taxes because it's the sharing economy. Now, what do I mean by the sharing economy? Now, there's a, everyone knows of Airbnb. This is the letting of a residential property, normally in someone's house or actually uh, the whole house. It could be a room. It could be the whole house is a fairly common one through Airbnb. Now, I haven't done that personally, but a lot of people I know have used the, um, use the service and, and it's quite uh, quite popular now. Other ones, of course, is the providing of taxi travel services. Now, Uber is the, the probably most common one there. I know my brother-in-law uses them all the time and loves them. Uh, other ones we've got, uh, which is under the, the sharing economy, is if you're just like doing um, odd jobs, um, and odd jobs could be um, pet sitting, um, dog walking, all these other little um, sort of odd job um, delivery. I've got there for delivery, um, furniture assembly, a few things like that where it's actually um, all comes under the same sharing economy. And, and, and because of the sort of probably the rise of Airbnb and Uber, the tax office have now taken it a little bit more seriously. So where these other sort of odd job things are always sort of under the radar, not really cared about too much. I guess with the, um, you know, the, the ATO's uh, focus on these other ones, they've um, come under the spotlight a bit as well. So I'll go through that a little bit later on. Um, another one, of course, is renting out car parking and storage places. That's sort of similar to Uber. And there's, there's always people that just do it themselves, but there's a number of companies coming up now that are doing that for you. So you might actually have a car spot uh, rather than like um, your house, you might actually have an extra car space and people are um, have, there's, there's businesses out there that'll actually um, uh, rent it out. Uh, one I didn't know about the other day, for example, if you are tra tra uh, traveling interstate, say to Melbourne for a couple of days, you can actually drop your car off at the airport um, for parking and they'll actually pay you for your car to park. Now, the reason they do is, of course, is there's other people that might be flying from Melbourne to Sydney that need a car for the day. So they actually give them your car to drive around in and they obviously return it before you come back from, from Melbourne. And in the meantime, you actually get paid for it. So instead of actually um, paying for car parking, you actually get paid. So that that's interesting. And that, of course, that, there's all these facilitators in there that are that are coming up with these, um, these concepts. So, that's what we're talking about, the sharing economy, just people doing their normal everyday stuff and earning some income from it. So examples, uh, like I talked about Airbnb um, and a few you know, pet sitting ones and you know, Uber are the, uh, the, the common ones. Now, as we go through the webinar, there's a couple of things we just need to get the terms right. So whenever I refer to, or the tax office in particular, refers to as the facilitator, they're talking about the company that runs it, like in this case, Uber. So they're the facilitator. That's, that's the term. Uh, the buyer is the customer. So that's the end user. So again, using Uber as an um, example is the person that gets in your car and gets asked to be taken from point A to point B. They're the user or the buyer is what the, the tax office uh, refer to them as. And you are the seller. The person who actually providing the doing bit is referred to as the seller. So you just be familiar with those terms, the facilitator, 
buyers and sellers as we go through the webinar and with examples. And particularly if you do go and do your research after this webinar, they're the terms you need to be familiar with. So tax obligation. Now, as a tax agent uh, dealing with lots of tax returns, um, these are the questions that I'm getting. Now, there's obviously a lot more uh, whether it's a good idea or not, um, but these are the questions that I get a lot more regularly than I was 12 months ago. So that's why I wanted to do a webinar on it today because these are the questions I'm getting. And the first one is, should I get an ABN? We'll go through the answers um, in, in a moment. Uh, second one, should I be registered for GST? Because a lot of times when you do have an ABN, well, the next question is, well, should I be registered for GST? So we'll go through uh, that as well. Um, third one is, what income is included in my tax return? What people are saying there is, well, should I be putting the income in my tax return is really what their question is there. And the third one is, well, all right, well, how much tax will I need to pay on all this? So it might have been a fantastic idea that you do a bit of Ubering or Airbnb or something like that. But then all of a sudden the tax comes along. And particularly if we start talking about potential capital gains tax, which I'll, I'll briefly mention, is you start going, oh, maybe, maybe it's not worth the extra bit of income. But anyhow, th those four questions there, I thought this webinar will only focus on those today. Um, yeah, obviously, you need to seek your own independent advice and all that sort of stuff. But we'll just go through those four things today and hopefully make it a little bit clearer for people who are either doing the, um, the share economy type stuff now or thinking about it. So firstly, do you need an ABN? Well, pretty much most facilitators now will request that a seller has an ABN. I was gonna say all facilitators, but there's, when we get to Airbnb, that's, they're, they're the exception. Besides Airbnb, pretty much all facilitators will request that the seller has an ABN now. And the reason is because the ATO has stepped in. Like I said before, they're a little bit more focused on this now. The ATO says that you are now an independent contractor. And as an independent contractor, you now have a business and you must follow strict ATO guidelines on what you need to do when you have a business. So the, the first step is you need an ABN. And like I said, I've got there most facilitators, but I really should cross that out and say all facilitators request that sellers have an ABN. So if you're doing um, Uber, absolutely, um, all the pet sitting ones, um, all that sort of stuff, you, you, you need to have an ABN and, and to be seen as an independent contractor. I won't go into the next one, but it can be like you don't have to be a sole trader. If you're um, doing um, any of this sort of work, the, the obvious thing is to be a sole trader. So if you've got a car and you're going to do some Ubering, um, you just become a sole trader, but you can be a partnership company or trust. Now, I'm not going to go into the, any more than that today, except mentioning it, but there obviously are different tax treatments for what structure you want, and there's reasons for it, but usually the main reason for setting up a company or a trust, um, the company is for asset protection, um, and I think in most of these situations, the facilitator has got enough asset protection um, to to, be, to justify. Uh, things like partnership and trust are normally set up to try and split the income. So say for example, you're the high income earner in the family and you're also doing the Ubering, well maybe um, a good idea to maybe think about setting up a partnership or a trust with your other family members or your wife or your spouse to share the income around a bit. Because if you're making you know, 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars on top of your income already, we're well, going to be taxed fairly high on that. So they're the sort of things you need to be thinking about if this income starts becoming quite significant. And again, setting up a car, company, partnership or trust may be expensive, so is it worth it? So again, seek independent advice on all that sort of stuff. But pretty much most facilitators will say this to you. If you do not have an ABN number 
or provide a valid ABN number, they will take out 46.5% withholding tax on the income that you've earned. And the reason they're doing that is because the tax office are making them do it. Okay, so, so even though most facilitators will, will request one, if you don't have one, they'll say, that's okay, life can move on, but they, they will take 46.5% tax out of what you earn if you don't have an ABN. Now, there, there may be a, a threshold. There might be, if you're making 100 bucks a week or something like that or something less, they may not. But once it starts becoming a reasonable amount, they, they will absolutely do that. And then it's up to you to try and um, recover that withholding tax from the tax office. Okay, really important that you get that. Like I said, I've got their most facilitators, but really it should be all facilitators will request uh, an ABN. Now, as I mentioned before, the tax office will now deem you as an independent contractor. And that's what the facilitators want as well, because all of a sudden, all the tax consequences and everything like that are thrown to you. You're not an employee anymore and will never be an employee of the facilitator. You are an independent contractor. What I suggest you do, I did a webinar, I'm not sure exactly, there it is, October, October 2016, on contractors, what you should know. So this webinar runs for you know, half an hour. So go and find it on my website, www.12.com.au. Find in the, the menu area, uh, webinars, and go down to recorded webinars and you'll find it there. And watch that, it's a really good, um, really good uh, uh, webinar. Oh, there it is there. Now, GST. Really important that you get this as well. So generally, uh, again, as a, as a business owner, generally you don't need to register for GST if your annual turnover is less than $75,000. Now turnover is just another word for sales. So your gross sales or your gross earnings from um, Uber or whatever you're doing, if it's less than $75,000, or is likely to be less than $75,000, you usually, but like any other business, <clears throat> not required to register for GST. Now, with, with GST, what the tax office do there, they say, well, um, if you think you're gonna go over $75,000, you should register. Now, if you get to the end of the year and you've gone and your turnover is $80,000 and you weren't registered, well, they're not, going to go and make you backdate anything. They normally say, well, well, from now on, you need to be registered. Okay, so, and in a lot of cases, you might've gone over the $75,000, but if you know in your heart that that was only a one-off because there's a couple of big sales or something like that, next year, you're not going to be over $75,000. A tax office will generally allow you to not register for GST. In this situation, um, it's really important to get this. Um, it may be an advantage though, to register for GST, even if your income is less than $75,000. Because when you're dealing with the end user or the customer, now they're gonna be charged GST by the facilitator anyhow. So they're paying GST, they're the end users. So the income that you get the GST has already been paid on it. So, so whether the facilitator then keeps the GST and pays it to the tax office, whether you're registered or not, it's, it's fairly irrelevant because it's between two entities that are either GST registered or, or not. And if you're both GST registered, it doesn't matter. You get the extra money from the facilitator and you just give it to the tax office. But what it actually does is it allows you to claim expenses and claim the GST on those expenses. Particularly if you're going to buy a new car or something like that. So if you're um, going to buy a $50,000 car and depending on log books and stuff like that, well, a fair portion of that GST or that $5,000 GST on that car, you may actually be able to claim as a GST credit and get that back from the tax office. Where the income, so, so for example, if you do $1,000 worth of work um, from Uber and you're registered for GST, what will actually happen is they'll give you 
Now that $100, of course, isn't yours. That goes off to the tax office. So you're left with a net of $1,000. But if you're registered for GST, all your expenses, your fuel, your telephones, your um, <laughs> all the other things that relate to you earning that income, the GST on it, you get to claim that back as a GST credit. Now, if you're not registered for GST, what would happen then, instead of you getting $1,100 from Uber, you only get $1,000. So it's exactly the same income, whether you're registered or not registered. But if you're not registered for GST, you don't get the GST on a lot of the expenses. So in a way, it's probably a better thing that you are registered for GST, particularly if you're going to come buy a car or something a little bit more expensive. Now, what happens then, of course, so if you register for GST, is that you've got business activity statements. Now, if you are running a business right now, you understand all about that. But if you're not, and you're going to the world of um, lodging business activity statements, and GST obligations, you're in a world of pain, right? Going into a world of pain right now. So you really do need to seek independent and professional advice on this, particularly if you're only just doing a small amount, it's probably not going to be worth it. Um, but if you are really thinking of um, this is going to be a significant amount of income, you absolutely need to get some um, independent advice. Again, if you're a client of mine, you probably would have asked advice already and I would have given it to you. Um, but, but absolutely do that. Now, having said that, like I said, it's generally, it's up to you. And for most of these um, shared economies, that's the way it's gonna be, it's your choice. And like I said, it usually doesn't make much difference, except if you are registered for GST, you actually might get a little bit more money back through your GST credits, but where the extra cost and hassle of having to do, do um, the GST registration with the business activity statements, it's probably not gonna be worth it in a lot of cases. Anyhow, having said that though, GST and Uber is Ubers are special, very special, because all drivers must register for GST even if they earn $75,000 or less, and there are no exemptions. So from the 1st of August, 2016, all Uber drivers must be registered. A, they must have an ABN, because you can't be registered for GST if you don't have an ABN. So they must have an ABN, and secondly, they must be GST registered. That's the way it is. And and, and people out there that are um, doing some work for Uber will get this. They would have been given plenty of letters and warnings and stuff like that. Um, to uh, make sure they're GST registered. So if you're thinking about it, make sure that before you sort of put your toe in the water, you've got all those things in place, ABN and GST registered. So they are absolutely special. Okay, moving on. I get this slide. So I explained to people about um, how it all works. And the reason you do this is because you actually earn income. Now, income normally results in tax, and we'll get to that in a second. So people go, oh, hang on, Derek, so what happens if I don't declare it as in the income? Okay, they go, oh, that's, don't like paying tax. So what the tax offers have done is that all the facilitators, um, like I said before, most facilitators, but really all of them, are required to obtain an ABN from you. Now, if you don't, they've been instructed by the tax office to take out 46.5% tax. If you do provide an ABN, you're now on the ATO radar. A, because you've got an ABN, the tax office um, know you've got one. And secondly, is most of these facilitators, I know Uber and Airbnb and a few other ones have as well, have done a deal with the tax office that they will provide the information on the income to the tax office. So most facilitators have an agreement with the ATO to provide your income to them. So the ATO will then just match this income against your personal tax return 
to ensure that it's included. Now, obviously, if you've got a company or a trust or something like that, same thing. But this is actually happening. And there's more and more of these facilitators are doing deals with the tax office, particularly they're getting a little bit in return regarding their reporting entities, and particularly this whole um, concept of an independent contractor. Because again, if you look at one of my other webinars, which I did um, last year on, is your employer really, is your contractor really an employee? As an Uber driver or anyone else like that, you look a lot like an employee. So as a result, the facilitators didn't want you to be a employee. And sometimes you may not be an employee for PAYG purposes, but you may be an employee for workers' comp and superannuation and payroll tax purposes. So what's happened is that the tax office have approached these facilitators and said, hang on, let's do a bit of a deal here. Now, we are thinking that a lot of these um, people you've got working for you may be employees. So if you can do a few things for us, meaning you get ABNs from them and you provide how much income they're earning every year, we will make a tax provision that those people are independent contractors and life moves on for them. So they've done that. So what if you don't declare it? Well, you'll probably be found out. That's all I'm saying. Last year, we were getting letters from the tax office saying, um, Dear Joe, um, we've been uh, informed by Uber that you earned $29.30 last year as an Uber driver. Please make sure you include this in your tax return. That'll continue to happen. All right, so like I said, as an independent contractor, you've got some business obligations. And like I said before, um, do you need a separate tax return for your business? Well, if you're a sole trader, you don't. And anyone that's had a small business uh, and needed an ABN, they'll, they'll, they'll understand what I'm talking about. But your normal personal tax return is your salary and wages and your normal work-related deductions. There's another section of it which comes under your ABM, but still under the same tax return that shows your gross sales and all your deductions for your business coming up with a net result. And that net result, it'll be a profit or in some cases will actually be a loss. Your expenses are more than your income. If it is a loss, there's a few rules about um, yeah, whether you can use that um, that loss against your other income. And most, most cases you can, and that can be offset against your other income, uh, like, a, a, like a rental loss or a negatively geared property. And it's just a separate part of your tax return. Obviously, if it's a company or a trust that has separate um, tax returns, you need to, um, to worry about and lodge separate tax returns. Um, what can you claim? Well, I won't get into a lot of detail about that, but usually people understand there's pretty there's hard costs. Like if you've got an Uber business, you know, you know your car registration, your petrol, your fuel, all those sorts of things. I'll go through an example a little bit later on in the webinar just to make that a little bit clearer. But anything that you uh, incur that relates to you earning income is normally a, a tax deduction. And we'll go through those uh, a little bit later. Um, well, actually, we'll go through them now. So this is an example I've got for an Uber driver. Um, again, because uh, motor vehicle related, um, you've got all those car uh, expenses that you need to be able to claim. Now, what I suggest you do, again, go and have a look at a webinar I did uh, back in August 2016, same place, www.12.com.au under webinars, all your car tax questions answered. Go and have a watch of that one. It talks about, you know, you know, logbook methods and FBT returns and using the statutory method and what you can claim and everything you need to know about um, having a car as a tax deduction for GST and income tax purpose and things like that. So, so I won't go through it any more than that. Just go until you go and um, have a look at that one. Now, Airbnb is a little bit different. Um, because it's not considered a business. 
the tax rules are the same for an Airbnb as having a rental property. Now, anyone who's got a rental property understands that that how that works. Again, part of your personal income tax return, there's a rental return showing your gross income and all your deductions and the net profit or loss on that goes off against your, uh, and gets included in the other part of your tax return. So as I said before, Airbnb don't require an ABN. And the reason is, is because they don't consider it a business. They consider it a rental a rental business. And um, unless you actually have 10 properties and they're all exclusively used for doing Airbnb, the tax office may consider that actually a business of providing Airbnb services, which is slightly different. But for the, the regular person, um, it's just going to be the same as having a rental property. Um, and with residential income, there's no GST. Um, that you can either charge or claim on residential income. So there's no requirement to, to register for GST. Now, the deductions are very similar as to a rental property. Um, all the same thing, council rates, water rates, everything like that. I'll get to the apportionment part of it in, in, in a second. So you've got all the normal rental deductions, but what you have to do then is apportion it. So say, for example, um, if you've got a rental property, it's really simple. Um, it's normally rented 52 um, weeks of the year. So if you have council rates, um, land tax, strata fees, all those different things, well, 100% of it goes off against the income on that rental property. Now with an Airbnb, depending on how you do it, it might be your whole house for a few weeks of the year or it might be one room of your house for all of the year or part of the year. But there's some sort of percentage you need to come up with. So say, for example, you've got uh, your house and you rent it out for two months of the year and the other 10 months you live in it because you're traveling or something like that. The way that works is two twelfths or one sixth of the, a portion of all your expenses. And that would be the normal things like council water rates, interest on your deductions, or if you're renting it, uh, a, a portion of your rent, and all those things that would normally be included in a rental property. Now, if it's different, say it's just one room of your house and it's available for the whole year or rent out the whole year, well, you go and work out the maybe the, the square meterage of that room, and it might come to 12% of your total floor space, including, you, know, you might have to include bathroom or something like that because um, that's included. And if it's 12%, where well, you take 12% of all those costs. You know, see how it works? Um, but there is definitely an apportionment on the, um, on the expenses. Now, just on that one as well, it's the tax office look at it on what the availability is. So I've got the property available rules. So you may have um, a property and you, you're traveling overseas for two months and you put up on Airbnb and it doesn't get rented out. It's just no one in there. And then you come back and you and no one stayed there. So you not, didn't get any income for it. <clears throat> The tax office will still allow you to claim those portions of the deductions because it was available to be rented. The fact that it wasn't rented isn't your problem. Mind you, the tax office will look at that in some cases where they think your the amount you're charging was in excess of what the market value was and therefore you didn't actually want to earn any income. And if you've got a history of doing that, a history of going away and not having income, going away and not having income, the tax officer may think, well, hang on, what are they up to here? But you might go away for a few weeks of the year and rent your place out, and some of them get rented and some of them don't. The tax officer say, when you come to do your apportionment, you are allowed to take a percentage of the time that it was available, not for when it was actually used. That's really important to, to get. Now, the sting in the tail, 
is the potential capital gains issues. And I'll go through an example of that um, in a second. But that's something that all of a sudden the tax office go, hang on, we're going to allow you to claim deductions for this income. Now, in a lot of cases, actually, the income will be more than the expenses. So the tax office can't be complaining if you're actually paying tax on the, um, the income you're earning. But there's also this potential capital gain because all of a sudden you've got an asset being your house that you have rented out like an investment property. So if you've got a rental property and everyone gets that, that a rental property that you sell has got capital gains issues. So in a way, your house, a portion of the time, now it may only be a very, 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 very small portion of the time you owned it, was income producing, the tax office will want a piece of that to be calculated for capital gains tax purposes. So again, just a few things, I won't go through in too much because people get rental properties um, and the sort of things you can get to claim, internet and phone costs and water and power council rates, upkeep repairs, depreciation, interest on your mortgage, all those things that you can claim and they just need to apportion it on a percentage basis. How you come up with that, whether it's floor space or time, or whatever, pretty easy. Most people get that. But it's the capital gains tax you need to understand is that when you sell your house in the future, there is a potential problem. And you need to sort of seek some advice on that because you may need to get a market value appraisal now before you start doing any um, Airbnb, and then another market appraisal when you stop. And hopefully there's no difference, if you know what I mean. Um, otherwise, it could be a potential um, capital gains um, down the track um, for, for your actual home, which is normally exempt for capital gains purposes. I've got there the income you normally make from Airbnb will usually outweigh the later effect of capital gains tax, but not always. I've done many calculations and it's very rare that the capital gains tax actually amounts to too much. But there's always a, an exception to that. I'm done there, so I've finished. So hopefully everyone got a little bit out of that. Now, the, the main things are, obviously, you need to seek advice. Give me some feedback on today's webinar, uh, say hi, um, email me at info at 12 and let me know if you've got any questions regarding any of the things we talked about today. And otherwise, um, give me a call and um, hopefully I can uh, help, you, uh, help you on the way to making some money without too many uh, problems. All right, well, thank you very much for listening. And if you, if you need anything else give me a call there check out my website but otherwise um, thank you very much and uh, goodbye for now